Panel discussion is starting if any of you want to join. Thank you. So it seems I've been <clears throat> elected to moderate for the next few minutes. Uh, again, I'm Jonathan Moreno from the University of Pennsylvania. And what I'm going to do is ask each of our participants to. Thank you. But now this is off. Oh, now it's on again. So uh, each, ask each of our participants to briefly introduce themselves. And then uh, I will start it with an opening question and we'll throw it out to everyone. So want to start us off, Barb? Just introduce yourself again. I'm Barbara Evans from the University of Houston. And I'm here in the capacity of a co-moderator. So I won't be speaking, but I'll participate in the question and answer session. Uh, nice try, Barbara. <laughs> Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Lockhart. I'm from the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, and I should state that any um, thing I say represents only my own views and not those of NHGRI, NIH, or HHS. And also, I would like you to know that the paper Barbara kindly cited this morning is available on our website at genome.gov slash LC. And as a good public servant, I sent her a PDF shortly after her talk. <laughs> Rob. I'm Rob Smith. Um, I am based in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College. Um, I'm a social scientist who works on the social and ethical dimensions of synthetic biology um, and I'm involved with two um, big publicly funded synthetic biology pro projects. Um, one uh, is a technology development project and the other one is a, is a social science project based in Edinburgh. Jantine. Uh, I'm Jantine Lundshoff. I'm a philosopher ethicist uh, in, the church lab, in the church lab uh, and at the University of Groningen. Uh, and I'm a collaborator to the SVOD lab. Thank you. So I, I wanted to uh, open up with a little discussion about public engagement. I felt like this morning there's quite a bit of interest in, in public engagement. And uh, I wanted to frame it in the following way and get everybody to respond. Uh, when I, uh, before I was at Penn, I, I was at the University of Virginia. And sometimes I would go and give talks around Virginia. And I noticed that um, I would often run into people the moms and dads who had sent their children to Charlottesville, to the fancy big university, uh, who were somewhat uncomfortable with what they were being taught at the university. In terms of the, what, what were the, the values that these funny-headed professors were teaching them, uh, these, these, the, these elites, and how were they maybe diverging from the values that their children were learning at home? Uh, and it struck me that that is a problem I believe it is a problem for scientists who are doing work that is often unintelligible to people like me and might even be unintelligible to the scientist in the next lab. They're speaking their own language. You have more in common, I would guess, with some of your colleagues in, on the other side of the world in Asia than you probably do with some of your neighbors in your neighborhood as scientists and as thought leaders in science policy. So uh, there does seem to me a big, uh, to be a big problem with public engagement. Uh, anybody have any thoughts about that? I know Barbara's already addressed it a little bit, so I won't put her on the spot again. But thoughts about um, lessons we could learn from your own work? Shall I go first? Yes, Please. sure. Um, so, okay, so I can't speak so much to these kind of uh, questions about um, parents and families engaging um, with, with what's being taught. But I can speak to um, the idea of broadening out, diversifying the kind of voices that are informing technological decisions and the projects that are being developed. Um, there have been some reasonable examples of that, um, especially in synthetic biology, um, where if you, uh, uh, so a, a lot of these projects are being developed explicitly to address societal goals, societal challenges, um, problems, environmental problems, health problems. Mm. Um, that are out there and um, a lot of time what you find is if you if you go out and you speak to the people who live in these places um, they might not be able to engage on the kind of the very technical terms but they can engage in defining the problems that you're trying to address mm -hmm. um, and that kind of knowledge is knowledge that is is hard to to get at 
um, when you're when you're working as a scientist, as a as a social scientist in a lab, and and that has proven very valuable in the past. So there's something we learned from communicating technological change and learning about public values from other fields that and a project like GP Wright could learn from. And incorporating it into the, the design of the, the, of the, the technologies, the, the program, the science. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? I think the Genome Institute has to do this once in a while. Okay. Well, well, we do. I mean, though we're largely a funder of research, that we do have an intramural program, yeah. so it's more funding that kind of work. Um, I mean, I, I would say that, um, as, as Robert pointed out, you, there can be a lot to learn from talking to communities about what problems they face and what uh, challenges they face and how those could be addressed. I think what could be an additional challenge for this kind of large scale problem is who is the community and who is the public you need to talk to. Mm -hmm. It's much different if you're engaging with a smaller group, either a particular neighborhood or maybe a particular community around what their challenges are. It's much, it's a whole different problem if your public or community is international or yes. even the whole US. And then once you kind of get into that sphere, how are you going to take into account all the different range of opinions you're going to come across? Right. If you think about the diversity of opinions, there's going to be you know, maybe there are a few groups people fall into, but there will also be some uh, maybe less commonly held minority views. And to what weight do you do you That's give a hard those? One. Yeah, Jantine, comparing between maybe the Netherlands and the U.S. and with respect to public attitudes towards science. Uh, uh, that is that is relatively uh, difficult. <laughs> uh, oh, no, uh, that's not so easy to to address. Wait, no this. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, no, what, what I, th um, I would like to raise here the point is that, that also from my experience, like when you're so close to science, um, there are two uh, difficult, or there are two aspects that are really challenging. One is that you may be perceived as like advertising uh, mm -hmm. science and uh, the ethicist being like a justification uh, device, um, which w w when you w when you are a real professional in in ethics, you are not a justification advice because that would be against the rules of our own profession because that's not what you're doing. You're like we are providing arguments, and the other. Um, uh, a related issue is that people often think when you address your, uh, when you introduce yourself as as like an ethicist or Elzai is then the word people know um, that the, that the perception is that you would be a science communicator, mm -hmm. and also science communication uh, that's a specific profession. It's a very special job, and um, people who are uh, able to do it, they have very, very different skills uh, of people who are ethicists. So you, you really need more people than, say, ethicists or science communicators. You really, I think for, for a, um, a challenging cutting edge project like GP Wright, you really need a team effort with people who all have their own ways of reaching out to the public. Barbara, did you want to say something about that? Well, not about, is, is my mic on? I don't want to comment on the difference between the Dutch and the Americans. Oh, no, <laughs> but on the issue of public engagement, I think there's a tendency that we have tried to make ethics and bioethics seem very serious and weighty, which they are. But in doing so, we've sort of excluded any possibility of fun. And I think the public doesn't, doesn't, get engaged because we make it so philosophical sometimes and so heavy. And I think we should um, take advantage of the capacity and technologies we have for engaging people in new ways. I'm known to be an advocate of, of perhaps involving people in crowdfunding some of the ethics and legal projects. Just to, I think that would give people a voice that they get to pick what questions will be addressed and then I think the objection to that is that we do have a very well-functioning peer review system for reviewing proposals for ethics and legal work, but that sort of makes it an inside debate where it becomes scholars talking to other scholars. So 
I like the, the way it's done on some of these reality shows like Dancing with the Stars. Let the peer review panel pass their judgment, but then have a Twitter feed where the public can weigh in. No, I don't yeah. like that one after all. Anything that would get people a little more ownership at an earlier point in the discussion of these issues, I think would add to engagement. And I think we should be very creative in considering possibilities of new ways to get people to have a stake in the ethics and legal debate. I thought you were going to recommend dancing with the ethicists, so I'm glad you didn't go there. Uh, in that spirit, well, another couple of questions. Uh, in that spirit, um, at Penn for the last couple of years, I've run a bioethics film festival, and uh, there's been quite a bit of interest in the community. People come in from Philadelphia, don't charge, and they come in and they see a film. We showed Avatar and her and Ex Machina last month. And uh, we, then we have an academic panel, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just great. Unfortunately, now what's, what's interesting is it's really hard to find a movie in which the scientists are not the bad guys, uh, uh, either by omission or commission. It's a separate problem. Next year, of course, Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a couple of questions. I saw, sir. I mean, I, I, mean I, I, think, I think medical Stumped. translation is one of the places you start, yeah. uh, but without exaggeration. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, been a big problem. Yeah. It's been a big problem. The Genome Project, I think it was a big problem for embryonic stem cells. I was part of the, the latter. Uh, and uh, so you have, to, uh, you have to be moderate, but explain how, what, what this could do in a reasonable period. But that's one place to start. Um, I think this gentleman and then this woman, yes. So Uh, yes. You know, the, I'm I sorry, the, the lady behind you and then the gentleman. Um, sorry for the pointer. Uh, I'm really resonating with a lot of what her friend is saying. Uh, one thing, if you look at how NASA has started, I'm not even going to mention this, I don't want to get too political. Um, Can we get a microphone? They've, they've done an amazing job of uh, getting people excited about a lot of the kind of obscure space programs that we mm -hmm. have that are highly technical. And one of the things I had, I was at a conference with one of the people that's one of their main presentation speakers. And her thing is, uh, you're excited about science, and you have to convey that emotion to the public right. of why you are so excited and interested in this particular project. And of course, do it in a way that is intelligible to them and not a bunch of, of jargon. jargon. Uh, my question, though, is to the panel. Uh, one of the things that uh, I co-founded a community lab in New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I began to see is that the people that would make their way to the lab, it's like preaching to the choir. So when you talk about people weighing in on ethical issues and funding, And how? <coughs> if we do, how? Yeah. No. So, so maybe this speaks to, to both of the, the questions about, you know, at what point do you, do you engage people? Like, what's your way in? And I think there are, there are different answers to that depending on the, the goal, the rationale of, of what you're trying to achieve. If you're, if you're trying to achieve something where, um, but in both, both situations, I think actually engaging on the terms of what are the real life um, 
kind of situations, experiences that people are having, and what are the kind of the emotional the emotional level that that makes it interesting for you is a is a reasonable starting point. The challenges are, you know, these are things that scientists. This is our job. These are things that we're excited about. And and questions about you know hype and over over hyping things are, are the real difficulties. But if you if you really start to at this point of um, trying to understand you know what what the kind of context is that you're that you might be able to produce something that that is useful to people, then I think that they will be able to then engage on on those terms. And and if I could just add on to that, I think it also really depends on what your overall goal is. So it's one thing if you want to garner support for science generally or increase the maybe the baseline scientific knowledge of the public over a particular topic. You might do that in a very different way through maybe museum exhibitions or, or other things like that that would reach a lot of people versus a more specific engagement activity perhaps around a project where you want to find out what do people think about this topic. Those are very different goals and they're related but I think they would take different strategies because I'm less yeah yeah because they feel threatened yeah, yeah. Hi, can you um, speak to whether there you see any um, unique ethical, social, and legal dimensions of this particular project as distinct from similar discussions that have gone on with CRISPR, stem cells, the human genome, uh, all, all such s similar projects that have taken place in the past? Is there anything that is specific to GP right? Um. Yeah, I, I think if, if, if you ask the question about something really specific, then, it, then you're ultimately looking at something specifically in the biology that would be of significance, would be morally significant for, for the rest of the discussions, or would be, say, from a legal point of view, so novel uh, that, we, that it doesn't fit in anything we know so far. Um, as far as I can see, my, my perception is that um, the, the genome synthesis as such, the, the, the engineering capabilities uh, at, at this by in, in this field of biology and, and uh, we're only at the start. So uh, the, the, the options that it, that, that it will open, that, that, that is truly new and that yeah, you know, we're able to create new organisms and what I said, like recoding, the notion of recoding as such and the resulting organism or resulting cell line, uh, you can ask very fundamental questions about it. You do not need to ask those questions. That's, of course, I, I think it, it's, um, uh, it, it should not be like, an, you know, you know, there is not a general obligation to be like morally concerned. Uh, this, this is also up to people themselves or, or to who for who uh, who is who's, who feels that this that this is a need and in the context of sheaf which you mentioned sheaf raises um, questions about the 14 day yes standard yeah. which is a big question for this community as well as for the public in general yeah yeah we th there would be the, the general question behind uh, behind it is that these technologies um, make um, uh, lead us to certain thresholds that we know from, from another context, like the 14-day rule um, um, it, um, pertains to real embryos. But what we had, uh, and what is then this called sheaves, um, uh, they are not embryos at all. And then you have the very novel question, uh, does, does this threshold that is meant for, for entities originating from a sperm and an egg, uh, do they at all uh, have a meaning for uh, an induced pluripotent stem cells that show certain morphological uh, uh, criteria um, when you look at it and maybe maybe shows the markers that indeed uh, are also uh, representative when, when you when you would have when you would have a, a primitive sweep in a, in, a, in a real embryo that you know you, you have the, the genetic markers that the expression that you that you can measure and when it's the same you say this must be very close. Still, it is, it is not the same. Uh, 
Thanks to the panel. Um, I have the sense that there's a tacit assumption that what we're doing is ethical and that what we're, a lot of the questions are circling around how do we convince those who don't have that, share that assumption? I mean, that, that, that's some of the undercurrent that I, I sense. Um, and the other th thing I don't think we're talking about much is that why is there such an, a quote unquote ick factor? And if there is such an ick factor where perhaps the um, less sophisticated um, uh, person looking at the project might um, be puzzled about why it's ethical. I mean, is there, are there some basic principles of how to proceed, first of all, establishing ethical principles for operation of the project, and then mm -hmm. um, making it transparent and clear? May I? Yes. <laughs> first of all, I think it's really important to be clear what is this project and what are some possible future things that might come 50 or 100 years from now from this project. As I understand this project, and I'll defer to the scientists actually involved, but this is a project that's doing basic science uh, to make better techniques for making big molecules of, of DNA and, and to be able to manipulate them. And as far as I understand, there's no thought of making embryos or people uh, at this time. And, and I, I don't want there to be any confusion about that. I think this, uh, the reason it seems ethical is that it's basic chemistry research. and provided that clear boundaries are set for the project so that the, the scientists who are engaged with it make a very clear statement of what they will and won't do, uh, it is unproblematic. And I think the, the concern, or the, as you're calling it, ick factor, is as people think, well, 20 years from now when we can synthesize a big DNA molecule, what might other people do with it? And I think the key thing here is to proceed slowly and very transparently and clearly and realize that there is some lead time in which there will be time to address these ethical issues that might come after this project. But and I, I just want to be very clear, I have not heard anyone saying that this project will even involve human subject research or certainly not work on embryos. So, so I would like to avoid any misconception about this and I defer to the project managers if I'm misstating that. Is that correct? So, so it's chemistry research is, is in my lawyerly understanding at this point. I was struck um, when I would sometimes, when, this is again back when I was at UVA, um, when I met the parents of kids who were homeschooled and going to University of Virginia. Being homeschooled, for those of you who don't know, means a lot. And it, it says something about the way that those parents wanted to con convey values to their kids. And when I spoke to them, uh, it was right in the middle of this human embryonic stem cell debate, which seems a long time ago now. I found that they, they weren't opposed to science or, or progress in science. What they were worried about was the moral compass of the scientists. And they didn't worry, they weren't getting up in the middle of the night or worry, talking to their ministers or pastors about physical chemistry. It was when, they, when you start messing around with human reproductive material, uh, that's what gets to be a problem. So I think we have to be very targeted in the issues that we um, suppose that they're worried about, they being people who are not, you know, the sorts of people who are in this room or following this online. Um, they're not, uh, creation scientists adopt the term science, uh, and that's not accidental. Yes, um, actually some of the issues have been already raised, but I think responding to your question, what is unique um, in terms of policy and, and, and ethics, I think that for the first time, all these disciplines that have been so much out of public scrutiny comes together. And we, we just still don't know 
uh, have not figured out the proper regulatory roadmap to mm -hmm. address them. So we have been putting fires, and you brought it up, the embryonic stem cell debate, um, and pointedly, rightly, that we should try to forget a bit about it because it's very destructive for the kind of conversations we want to have here and to proper anticipate responsible science. Um, I think it's around 44 years ago, there was the similar conference, uh, 1973, recombinant DNA technology. There was a great deal of controversy. There was a bunch of people that wanted to put a moratorium on, on that kind of research. <laughs> I was just reading through some of the letters and correspondence, and the wordage that they described then is extremely similar to the same kind of wordage that's been described by people who are yeah. against this kind of technological uh, innovation revolution, which makes me think that 44 years, nothing has progressed in <laughs> the public uh, interaction with science, technology development. Now, I'm assuming that part of your professional lives on the panel is to think about that and work out, you know, where have we gone? Have we gone wrong? That's my one question. And if we have, why are we having the same debate now that we had in 1973? Very interesting. So, thanks, Paul. <laughs> um, I mean, so this speaks to both of these these things, right? These are these are potentially sticking points. These are value judgments, um, and I think it's very important to remember that um, the kind of the ethic that that we have in this room um, is a particular kind of ethic. It's it's also um, it's not disinterested. It's interested in in doing this kind of research, um, and. Um, and and there are ways to to start aligning that that research with with things that you might see as, as sticking points as as critics and and that's about having again serious conversations about purpose who is this for um, who is who is this project for um, I think that from um, sitting through these pilot project proposals they're all really exciting um, but they're very very diverse. And um, it's really important to not talk in terms of ethics at a very high level as some kind of generalized thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's very situated, um, it's very personal. Um, and so to really try and focus in on the, the, the issues or the things that are specific to each of these, these projects. And, and that would be my advice for trying to maybe bridge what we see as, um, as sticking points. Mm -hmm. I think the debate 30 years ago, as one of the older people in the room who remembers it, was in intense because at that time we did not understand how complex inheritance was going to be. And in the 70s and early 80s, we thought we might be five years away from being able to fully predict a person's health future. and, and we just didn't understand that it was going to be a much longer road to figure all this out. And I think the intensity of the debate at that time in part tracks to our lack of understanding. Now we're having some of that same intensity because it does seem that perhaps we are getting closer to understanding how to uh, affect genetic inheritance, but we're still, I think, with the wisdom of 30 or 40 more years of experience, I think we have more humility now than we did then. We, we realize we're not five years away. But the debates resonate because we were sort of overestimating then.